Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Bruce's Bees. Tonight, I'm joined by a special guest, uh, Ashby Miller from Ashby Farms NC. Ashby is a, uh, I guess, a sideliner beekeeper up in North Carolina. And Ashby, why don't you introduce yourself to us a little bit and tell us who you are? Well, Bruce, start out with uh, saying thank you for having me on uh, your channel. I really appreciate it. It's been nice getting to know you. Um, so we run about 300 colonies here in the central Piedmont of North Carolina. We're out of Burlington. It's kind of right on the I-40 corridor. And, uh, this year we're going to be expanding that up to about 800 hives. The goal is to leave my day job next year. Uh, I'd initially intended to leave this year, but, uh, decided to stick it out one more year. So we're a little busy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. I feel busy with the number of colonies I have. So you've got at least double what I have already. You're going to expand even more. So that's pretty impressive. Um, but we, we discussed briefly kind of what we wanted to talk about tonight already, uh, kind of a theme. And I had the privilege of, you know, getting to know you a little better. I was driving. You were a captive audience. A little over a week ago, I was driving up to Montgomery for a, a ball game. And and we discussed a lot of topics and got to know you pretty well on the phone call. So I was really impressed with what you're trying to do. And I think this will be fun tonight. Introduce you to uh, quite a few people, and and uh, you've got some really good strategies and, and thoughts for how to do things. And I've I've looked at your channel a little bit, and uh, you know you got it going on. You've got a good good uh, grasp on I think a lot of the fundamentals and, and a good idea of kind of where you've been and where you're going. And so I'm excited to get to know you a little better tonight and, and discuss the topic. So a lot of people are at this. You know, there's, there's different kind of levels of beekeeping. I don't know really how to define them. People say you got hobbyist sideliners and commercial beekeepers. And obviously between each category, there's a gray area. There's a little bit of a shift that has to take place in mentality. What, what your thoughts are. I think most people probably start off as hobby beekeepers. They get a couple of hives and they just enjoy it so much. And we know that bees multiply. And so you got to do something with those bees when they multiply sometimes you you may lose half of them and just re replace them with the splits that you made sometimes you have more success and before you know it you've got way more bees than you want and as you learn and gain more skills and you kind of decide what you want to do lots of times the sites get set a little bit higher as far as what you want to do and so then you think well maybe i can make a little money at this thing and you become what i call a sideliner i think that's the sideliner category it becomes almost like a part-time thing i think even hobbyists lots of times will make enough money to feed the obsession you know they sell honey yeah. they sell oh, some yeah. wax and some different products to continue to buy the the equipment they need to grow or to keep their hives maintained maybe to buy better equipment better extractors and things like that but when money becomes a goal and an issue and it becomes a side business that's kind of how i categorize a sideliner beekeeper would you agree with that oh yeah oh yeah <clears throat> well when i started getting into this uh, one of my local mentors here his name's mike ross and he runs about 100 colonies and mike's just a great guy um we were joking around and I think it came up in an early conversation and said that, you know, the quickest way to become a millionaire beekeeper is to start with 2 million. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, yeah. I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, man, it's been a, you know, like you said, when, when money starts getting involved and you decide to make it a business, um, it can really, it can really call it, it, It's a lot of investment depending on how big your dreams are. I, uh, I had somebody the other day comment on YouTube. I think they were just kidding around. They said, you know, how much time does this business take and how much money, you know, are you looking at? And I said, well, it, it takes all your money and it takes all your time. <laughs> um, still working a day job, being a dad, getting married here in a couple of weeks. Um, wow. You, you know, we, we, it's a lot and it's springtime. It's a lot going yeah. on. So um, we've set up a, a pretty good business goal. Corey is really good at business as well. Um, so we've outlined a really good strategy for uh, where we want to be and how we want to get there and kind of what that end goal looks like and just kind of did the backwards math on it to get to where we are now. You know, one of the things that we talked about in extensively on that phone call was it was kind of your um, goals, your ideas about raising queens and how important that is. Um, so I think that's kind of where we wanted to go with the conversation tonight yeah. about, first of all, why would you want to do that? And second of all, how is it going to help you in your operation to reach your goals? And thirdly, how are you going to do it? How are you going to get set up? And what, you know, just kind of walk us through some of that. I know you, we talked about you have a relationship with some um, pretty high profile people in the VSH community and the uh, queen rearing community in the country. And, and you're kind of, I guess, been able to rub shoulders with some people that are pretty 
pretty prominent and you know you have yeah. so kind of talk to us about know, Corey stevens is one of those people and you got some local folks right there where you live or close uh, by that are kind of you're kind of working this little program so tell us what you can about that and and just kind of talk about just what your plans are here because i think you know obviously you're doing something unique in your situation but i, I think you have a lot of ideas that can help anyone yeah. reach their goals so so what do you one, think? one of one of the, I guess our, our main topic here would be raising quality queens. I'm all about if you're going to spend, especially the money and even more importantly, the time and you are deciding to get bigger, some folks, while it is easy to let somebody else handle the queen rearing aspect, I quickly realized that making quality queens is something that sideliners can do and realistically should do. So to give you a quick overview, um, I did a lot of cold calling and knocking on doors and meeting people over the winter. And I found an area that's about three miles by three miles. So it's about nine square miles. And as far as I know, there's only seven hobbyist, uh, there's seven hobbyist hives. There's two beekeepers in my area in in that area. So a lot of it's old family land and Susie's cousin and this and that. And, So essentially it kind of worked out where there's an island. Um, There's not a whole lot of bees. And so I looked at that as as an opportunity. So if you can imagine our our queen mating yard is right in the center and we've got 20 colonies there and they're all cell builders. Um, So you've got 10 cell builders and 10 support hives to keep them packed. And then uh, if you go say a mile in any direction, there's a Pentagon that spans about two miles um, with right, right in the center would be that queen meeting yard. So virgin Queens, when they emerge, they don't want to cause inbreeding. And so drones only fly out about a half mile. So virgin Queens on purpose fly out about a mile. And so no matter which direction um, those Queens choose to go, I've got, I've got five B yards in the surrounding area. So we've got, um, you know, an average of 20 colonies at each BER. We've got 120 colonies in this nine square mile area. And basically we're just flooding it with quality drone stock. And so that's one of the, I consider three aspects of making really quality Queens. Um, To make quality Queens, you need a, a high drone count, meaning she needs to breed with a lot of drones. You need great selective stock. And, um, and with that, you need to be able to control the, uh, the female and the male aspects of that. Uh, and then of course, the third, uh, third aspect is, is graft, learning to graft and learning to get the hives to feed those queen cells really well. We want to see a lot of Royal jelly. So we spent last season, uh, Corey, my fiance and I, uh, we spent last season with a goal of let's, let's screw up. <laughs> let's, let's get good at grafting where it's very predictable. We like hives that are about to swarm and we go in there and steal the queen. And then we give them some more bees and just pack them out, feed them pollen patties. I like to follow, you know, Bob Benny's methods a lot. I'm, I'm really think his content is quality. And uh, so we make really quality cells. We are, um, you mentioned having rub shoulders with, one of my very good friends um, is uh, Phoebe Snyder. She's business partners with Kara Wagner with Optera, and the UBO test is going to be up and coming this year. And we're going to be uh, one of the handful of commercial farm uh, commercial beekeepers, and uh, we're going to be performing that that brood assay. And that's a true selective way to test your colonies to test to see if they are. Uh, if they have VSH traits, meaning just like uh, uh, traits in people, you know, the easiest one's redheads, right? R- redheads are a recessive trait, but if you, if you get the right uh, situation genetically, then you can, you know, two redheads most times have a redheaded kid. You can select bees for that same process. So we're selecting for a number of things. The first grade is how do these bees come out of winter if they don't come out swinging and, and this is an early spring we're we're two to three weeks ahead of time currently i've got hives that are just booming but there's not enough drones in the in the in the air 
So we're just doing everything we can to, to hold off swarming. Um, we're, we're spreading the wealth, meaning stealing brood from the strong ones, giving them to the weak ones. We're giving them space, interrupting the brood nest with a, with a foundation frame, just anything we can do to set them back. Uh, I think that your sideliner guys, they can really, you know, with a, if you've got a hundred hives, you can set up a really quality mating program for yourself. Um, I estimate it probably take five years. When we do a, we're going to do our, our UBO uh, brood assay test um, with Optera first week of May. And at that point in time, your, your drone population is peak. Um, we've got a lot of genetic diversity. With our, with our operation, I have uh, eight yards within about 20 minutes in all directions. So when we were building this business last year, we were breeding in three of those yards um, because of their proximity to other um, larger outfits, other beekeepers. Um, we want a lot of genetic diversity. This year, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be trading queens with some guys from a few counties over. Um, just two queens, but if I trade two queens with five other beekeepers, and, and I, I respect their opinions, they're... Um, they're, they're all very experienced, much more than I, as far as years go. Um, I'm going to give them two of my best. They're going to give me two of their best. And w- the whole goal is genetic diversity. The, the, more, the more genetic diversity you've got, the better the queens. It's, it's just a matter of taking the time to get to know the folks, you know, within a mile of your, of your queen mating yard and um, just kind of setting up the right conditions. And I think, you know, it, it's – it's going to be a goal of ours next year to be a major queen producer here in North Carolina. Um, so that's, well, that sounds really good. And kind of let's back up a little bit about, I guess it was about a week ago, actually, or so I put out a video from Corey Stevens where we defined VSH, uh, UBO, uh, IPM, and also SMR. But go back briefly. Those two, those two acronyms you used, I uh, used the terms, uh, UBO was the main one, VSH. Briefly describe what those mean for folks that may not have seen that video from Corey. Okay. So VSH is um, Varroa Sensitive Hygienics, meaning uh, bees have good hygiene in the hive, and certain bees are really good about controlling Varroa on their own. And that's what Corey has spent the better part of 15 years breeding and selecting and running a treatment free program and culling out those genetics and his stock is just phenomenal. Um, there's a handful of people in the United States that are doing this. And so a lot of people like to say we have a VSH queen. Well, if, if their breeder queen is instrumentally inseminated, then the daughters of those have a 50% chance of carrying that trait. And so the further you get away from that breeder queen generation wise, the the less chance it is that they will continue carrying those traits. The other, so so that's VSH, Varroa sensitive hygienics. And then the UBO assay is a um, a stress hormone. Just, Just imagine, it's, it's like a perfume spray. That's the best way I know to describe it. You spray it on the brood and let's, let's talk about two different types. So, so traditionally when we look at bees and how hygienic are they, um, with the, they do what's called a freeze brood, a freeze brood assay with liquid nitrogen. You come in and, and most people use a PVC pipe and you stick it down on, on a section of brood and you pour the liquid nitrogen in and it freezes the brood. And so then you give it 24 hours, you, you put that frame back in the hive, you come back 24 hours later and you, you pull it and you look at it. And if the bees are really hygienic, then they'll pull all those frozen brood out. And while that test is good for, for hey, how hygienic are our bees, it's completely different than a Varroa sensitive test because this new UBO, it's a, it's a brood odor and when you spray it on there, it's basically telling the bees, hey, there are varroa inside of these larva, capped larva cells. So you put it back in and you only have to wait two hours, not 24 hours. So you come back two hours later and you pull out the frame of brood 
And we can see, were these bees not only hygienic, but are they hygienic towards Varroa? This is untested waters. This is going to be, you know, the holy grail of beekeeping will be to find a genetics that you can consistently produce generation after generation that are Varroa sensitive, but also are good honey producers over winter well and don't go through a lot of stores. You know, when, when you start selecting for one, you oftentimes have to sacrifice another. Mother Nature doesn't like too much of a of one thing, that, that, and that, that's in anything. So uh, this is kind of the wild, wild west of, of the new frontier of selecting for Varroa sensitive hygienics is going to be this brood assay. Um, it's just coming on the market this year, and I know that they're, uh, they're working with a number of, uh, a small number of commercial outfits uh, across the country. And I just happen to be really good friends with the right person at the right time. When, when, when Phoebe told me about this a few years ago, I was like, this is going to be just frontline stuff. And she, you know, even at the time she was like, nah, it's not really good. Well, now they're, they're really making, you know, Kara Wagner is really making a name for this. and uh, Phoebe as well. And both are with UNCG. I'm, I'm blessed in Burlington. I'm 30 minutes from Raleigh and Greensboro. Uh, that's UNCG in Greensboro and uh, NC State, Dr. Tarpey at, uh, in Raleigh. So we have a lot of research nearby. I'm, I'm very blessed with the people that I know. Just dumb luck. But, man, it's, uh, it's given me a lot of wisdom. I've been able to get educated or kind of up to speed really fast. And not only that, but, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I, you know, from our talk just a couple of weeks ago, like, you and I really enjoy – it's almost the nerdy side of beekeeping. It's the, it's the fine little details. It's the research. It's what's going on. It's who's doing what around the country. It's, it's caring more than just, you know, I've got 10 hives in the backyard. I enjoy you guys doing the research and I enjoy myself, you know, being able to capitalize on that. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, research yeah. in the future, but um, that, that's really cool. I, UBO means unhealthy brood odor. And uh, for folks that may not know what the term assay means, it's spelled A-S-S-A-Y. It mean, just means test. So it's anytime you hear the guys like Ashby or Corey um, or anybody like that talking about an assay, they're talking about a test, different kinds of tests they do. And I guess it's a scientific term, so that's pretty cool. But Just to jump into one other term that we ought to define as a, as a SMR test. Um, in the early 90s, Dr. Harbo uh basically did a test where you, you go in in august you look under a magnifying glass or a pair of magnifying glasses and you, you pull out a hundred larval late stage past purple eyed really they should have some pigment and you're you're looking for um varroa and really the the babies that have there's a gestational period in there where the varroa has uh multiplied and when you pull a hundred cells uh, and you're looking, if you, you, there's a there's a score, you can look this up on YouTube for anybody watching. But if it scores well, you come back a few weeks later and you do another assay and you pull 200 cells. And if it does really well, you come back, you take 700 cells. And if it continues to score really well uh, as a colony, then y you would consider that your uh, your good breeding stock because it's in, in, they do exhibit the trait of varroa sensitive hygienics the nice thing about this new test is how quick it can be done i mean two hour turnaround we can go into a yard and you know we can we can test maybe 15 or 20 hives wait two hours and go back and look and and, and grade them right there on the spot same day this will be really really big to the beekeeping industry as a whole the queen who exhibits the vsh trait for us, in our breeding program, they have to overwinter well, and uh, they have to be gentle. I'm not going to – I know you – when we were talking, you told me about some of your hives are a little spicy. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not selecting for spicy hives, but in, in, in inadvertently, we get spicy hives. Um, and for everybody who doesn't know, spicy hives are uh, really defensive. ornery, defensive. Yeah. And, you know, you made a good point. You have skunks, raccoons, possums. Sometimes those defense behaviors are good for survival. 
you know, you mentioned that a lot, some of your viewers write into you and they say, man, you know, you, your bees seem like they're really angry. At some point we don't mind. Uh, I don't mind. I'll, I'll glove up and I've got certain hives. I just know they're going to be hot. I think everybody deals with this. This isn't, it, it, it's a myth to think the university of Guelph and the girl from Texas bee company, you know, they make beekeeping look really, you know, fa fantasy land. You can go out there in shorts and no suit on. And I don't have bees like that. <laughs> I don't know that you do either. Yeah. I, you know, I've got some that are kind of like that, but you know, I just prefer to suit up. And I know in Texas that all the hives down there are not like that. Uh, I think that yeah. they have to pick and choose somehow to be able to make those videos. She's not, I mean, I'm sure she suits up for a lot of what she does. I think they're very good. I mean, I think they, they run bees. That's their business. So I think that they're probably pretty good at dealing with bees, but I think that they save the really gentle ones. They do somehow she's able to let her hair hang down on the hive while she's removing and stuff. And, and I think university of Guelph, I, I do believe that they, that they have a very gentle bee up there. I know that you know, Tom Nolan was down here a couple of weeks ago um, yeah. with Cormac pro and he did an interview with him and you can see that on this playlist. The playlist is intentional beekeeping is where I'm going to put these videos on, um, but okay. You know, he talks about how he works his kind of, I mean, like he may wear a veil, but he doesn't have to wear other protective gear. So my bees were not that bad. And he's like, Ooh, they're getting a little, a little bit fired up. I'm like, right. They are, they are you know, kind of. A thing. So, <laughs> so I do think that, that, that there are bees like that. I've had some colonies like that that are really gentle, but I, I don't mind when I first got into beekeeping, we talked about this. My mentor told me, he's like, if they're a little defensive, it's okay because of the pest and the, and the predators that are out there, but, but they've got to be workable and they've got to be enjoyable for, um, anyone to get into. And that's my goal with, with bees. If I start doing selling nukes and Queens more, I want to be able to have bees that are, you know, I, I understand you're going to have a colony here or there, but I just, I, that's my confidence level. I want to make sure they're going to be good bees that are not going to be too, too crazy. And, and my bees are getting better. They're getting a little better each year. It seems yeah. like I'm trying to work on that. So they're getting better, but well, take us through um, kind of your uh, philosophies. We've talked about a little bit already, the queen uh, rearing philosophies. Um, tell, tell me how you think that, you know, it doesn't have to even be a, a sideliner or someone, it could even be a hobbyist. How can making your own queens, uh, what is the advantage to that? Let's just say a person's got 25 hives. There's no reason that you couldn't, you know, just, just go out three quarters of a mile in three directions and put three hives from a central point where you're going to have your splits. Um, you're just creating a, a drone flooded area. For me, one thing I noticed on, very early on, um, the choke point in expansion is a quality laying queen. Just this week, we had, uh, I had two nights ago, I found six nukes and there was just a softball where the bees, I call it one frame. Um, but the queen had, you know, a little patch of brood about this big and she's laying fine. It was a uh, uh, last July split. So I found some strong colonies and uh, we went in there and we just stole a bunch of a bunch of brood and a bunch of nurse bees and put them in the hive. And uh, we did that with all six. And I was talking with somebody today about, um, you know, did you use newspaper? I just put a little sugar water on the colony to cause them to gorge and that, that makes that queen acceptance go up. And I just walk away and I don't worry about it. Um, now that's to me that you've got five frames of brood and bees. It's going to populate that hive. The, the real choke point for anyone, whether you've got 25 or 100 or 200 and, and you're looking to expand, is the number of queens laying. So I like queen castles. We, I've got a 10 frame box with uh, dividers and we do four two frame hives inside one box. It's got a double screen bottom board on it. So for earlier splits, we can catch the heat from the lower colony to, to keep all four of those warm. We run about a 70%, 70, last year was a 71%, I call it a take rate or a rate of success. Uh, meaning for every 100 queen cells we put into a split, 71 are successfully mated. And we're happy with with what they what they look like their their laying patterns, and I think that's probably standard for Mother Nature. Um, if you're hitting eighty percent, you're doing something really well. Um, so we're always looking for that two percent here and three percent here and two percent here, and, and it 
you know, it adds up that 10%. I think that for a small person though, if you're wanting to expand, just having the equipment, nuke boxes. Um, nu I started my whole operation on just nukes. And now flash forward, you know, we've got 650 nuke boxes available at any time. So I like to make a lot of, you know, weak splits, but you know, maybe early on it's two frames of brood, one frame of food, feed them in, in, in those early six weeks. It doesn't matter if you're feeding them sugar, your whole goal is just a quality queen. Once you get through a cycle, six weeks, all the bees will cycle out, and now we, you know, we 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 get to watch the traits of those new queens um, get expressed. Whether that is um, quick brood builders, whether it's good honey producers, um, whether it's just gentle bees. But when you get, you know, for our operation this year, I've got 300 colonies to choose from. We're gonna pick 120 of our best to bring into that breeding area. So the more queens you get, the more options you have. Maybe I should say that, the more options you have. Um, and then also, you know, we took about a 15% loss over winter. It's, it's not great, it's not terrible, but I'm pleased with a 15% loss. Even after the 15% loss, we've got more than enough colonies to do exactly what we need to meet our business goals. Because at the end of the day, if, if I wanted to go broke, I'd stay home and sit on the couch. We are running this as a business. I make all my decisions, they're business decisions. Um, so we're always thinking about, you know, I'm thinking three to five years down the road. I can already tell you uh, almost to a T uh, what my plan is for this year and next year. It's just a matter of executing it and uh, to, to meet not only our financial goals, but our, our life goals. My main goal is to, to work for myself full time. Another example of the sideliner who, who gets into queen rearing is you develop another income stream with what you've already got going on. You know, queen castles, especially if you're building your own, are fairly inexpensive and, and really open up an income stream for you. So, you know, for us, when we've got 600 nukes, you know, for next year, we can make an early split. We can let her lay. I, I like to let my queens go for 21 to 24 days. Um, sometimes it goes a little past that, even 28 days. But I follow the research at about 21 days, the queens really develop their pheromone. They get their sea legs. And uh, that's a really marketable queen, especially if you've got a good breeding program. No reason we couldn't turn around and you know, the, the time consumption there is going through 600 nukes to find that many queens when it's just a me and Corey operation, just the two of us. Um, but then we can turn around and have cells ready and drop another cell right in. And, uh, you know, we can get two rounds of queens before, uh, before our, our nectar flow hits. Um, you get a lot of options when you invest in the education of developing quality queens. The return, it, it's... If it's just trading your time for, for, for the education, the monetary options, you know, you know it's, it's just like uh, if, if you're going from being a master's to a PhD, suddenly the, the opportunity to make more money goes way up based on your education. Um, so for me as a, as a business owner, that, that's how we look at it. Um, lots of education just enables us to develop another income stream. Well, as your skill level goes up, so does your efficiency and your ability to be successful. All those percentages you talk about get better and everything just gets better. And obviously there will be years where mother nature doesn't agree with everything. Oh, and there might, be, there might be some down years and some, but, but as long as you're doing the right things fundamentally, you know, for example, if the weather's not good, you can, you know, you can feed and supplement and maybe have more expense in that area. If it just stays cold too long, I mean, you just, it's just, it's rough sometimes. You may not get as many queens as what you had hoped, but you have a plan and a trajectory for where you want to go. And I know that it does become very labor intensive. I mean, I'm, my problem is I'm just trying to, I do pretty much, I'm going to say all the beekeeping activities, but most of them like in the hives, probably 95 plus percent of that I do. I, I like, I, I have folks come and help me sometimes yesterday. I, we, we started setting up some splits. Um, 
uh, Brian Lee, who's, who's up in Birmingham, he wanted to come and hang out. So he did, and he helped me, but, um, most of the time I'm doing it mostly myself. And so that's just a really just time consuming and trying to develop that skill of queen rearing. I, what I, what I really should probably do, which I just can't make myself do is drop back to a, a smaller number of colonies and really develop those skills and then grow from there. But I, what I've did from the start was I just exploded my, my count. I've done that my whole beekeeping career, just grown. And, uh, I've made a lot of Queens just through all the different ways you make splits, you know, but that, that yeah. a lot of them aren't quality. A lot of them are really good Queens and some of them just aren't. And uh, it hasn't been a real intentional, you know, breaking out the, the cell starters and the mm -hmm. cell builders and all the different things I haven't done. I've tried that a couple of times, but it's just a, a real time sensitive thing. And I just haven't developed that skill. I need to, and I'm working with some folks. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of what you're doing. We, I've worked with um, working with Greg and with Corey and some different people to try to just kind of get some genetics really set up in my favor here. The yeah. local stock here in this area is very hardy and tough and rugged. It's, it's pretty dang good stuff, but they are a little spicy. Um, that's my biggest drawback to the local stock. We do have some really good bees that build up into nice, strong colonies and make a lot of honey and you know, and a lot of them are really good. A lot of them aren't that way, but you just have some that are pretty, pretty hot. And so that, that's the biggest trait that I want to kind of breed out of them. And I frankly think that a lot of the local feral stock is fairly mite resistant because I don't have, you know, I've got mites. I do have some mite bombs in every bee yard, but most of them test pretty consistently, you know, within a reasonable number of mites. And so I think there are some good uh, local feral stock uh, bees here. But I do want to introduce more of, a, I guess, once again, that term intentional, which is what kind of I'm trying yeah. to develop. That's kind of the theme of my channel and going forward is, is more intentional beekeeping. By, inter by talking to people like you and Corey and Tom and just, you know, a lot of people, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to be more intentional with what I'm doing and not just all over the place. And by doing that, I think I'll be able to develop a stock that benefits both my operation and hopefully in the future, you know, maybe be able to sell more dukes and queens and things like that from my stock. Can I ask you a question? Uh, um, sure. This is something that was a, a big game changer for me last year. Um, somebody brought it up to me, which is about how many minutes would you say you spend in each hive? Oh, it's, yeah, it's too many. <laughs> I don't, it just depends on what I'm doing. If I'm doing a video, it's a long time. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. You see absolutely. these videos that I do, like the last few I've done, um, that one I did, that's, it's been my most successful video in the recent times. The one on the four way split that I did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I saw I mean, that. It, it, was, it took me, yeah. I probably, it took me probably 45 minutes to do that or an hour to do that. But of course I was trying to walk through everything and trying to really yeah. tell everyone what my thought process was. And then I, you know, of course, when you include the editing and everything that took a long time, but you know, if I was going to do that without the phone going and split it the four ways, it probably would have taken me 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to do that, which wouldn't have been a bad length of time. But when I'm going through colonies. If I'm just checking to see how they're doing, you know, if I see eggs, I'm in and out. If it looks healthy, you know, I, yeah. sometimes you just pop the lid and you see, you know, bees all the way across the top, eight frames of bees. And you, if you're on pallets or whatever, you can just pick up the bottom and look and you see a cluster of top to bottom through the whole thing. And you know, hey, these bees are healthy. So you don't have to That's spend right. time in there. And if you want to see what the brood's looking like, if you want to see the health of the colony, uh, as soon as you see eggs, you know, there's a queen. That's all you really have to see. You know, pull That's out the right. outside frame to see some food, maybe go a couple more frames over and see some brood and eggs. Look at the brood pattern, make sure it's nice and a nice sheet of brood. And you can just, you get to where you can read the frames and you can just tell the health of the colony. And uh, I'm seeing this year, I think because I did a better job last year about mite control overall, the bees just seem to be more vibrant and healthy looking and happier. And so I wonder if that was part of my problem with spiciness in the past is maybe my bees just had some issues with, with the, you know, being sick, just having some sure, viruses sure. and some mites and things like that, because I've treated for mites for the last few years. Up until a couple of years ago, my primary treatment was oxalic acid vapor. I just hit them with that. And, um, you know, it works okay when there's not much brood or no brood, but when there's brood, it not, it keeps them in check, but it doesn't knock the count down. Like you're going to, you're going to, you may, right. if you got, if you wash, if you wash 12 mites, you're going to wash 12 mites. You may not wash 20, but they're, they're not going to knock the numbers down when there's brood. It may, it's more of a maintenance. It's more, it's more of a maintenance. maintenance. So, you know, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize that or maybe didn't believe it. I'm like, well, my bees survive fine. But then I started actually last year being more, what's that word? Intentional. Right. Checking before and after the treatments, kind of really uh, focusing in on, you know, not every single colony I probably should, but, you know, kind of spot checking and um, 
you know, really seeing, hey, this 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 colony washed ten mites. Well, if I treat with Apivar, come back and test again afterwards that same colony and see what the numbers are to see what's working. You know, I've learned a lot about what was effective and what wasn't effective, and so it's helping me moving forward to to have a better plan. So. Really, yeah. you know, the, you asked the question, how long do I spend in a colony? It depends on what I'm trying to do. Yesterday, we're doing the old, uh, trying to, I'm trying the quarry method. This is how I'm doing it. So I hope I don't screw this thing up. But um, what I, what we did yesterday, Brian came down and th- my problem is I have 40 cells coming. This is another thing. If I can do my own Queens, I can get the cells ready when I want them and not have to depend on yeah. somebody else to do it. So, but we have, I have 40 cells coming next week. So I really need to get splits done. And so yesterday, Brian came down. And uh, we actually took brood, set it above the queen excluder, moved it, moved it up, and put drawn comb and some foundation down below, and kind of mixed everything in there so there was still some brood. Made sure that you know shook them down so hopefully the queen she should be in the bottom box or below right. wherever the level is. And uh, the idea is that the bees will work that, continue to work that brood through the coming week. And we tried to keep some open brood in there as well so that not all the brood is going to emerge this week mm-hmm. and there not be any brood. So we tried to try to get some open brood up there as well. And then my goal this coming Friday I'm off is to just take those splits, pull them off, and uh, on Saturday drop a queen cell in, might destroy any queens, destroy any queen cells that are on those frames. And so that took a while to do that, to go through some of these colonies are just big monster colonies that we had to kind of dig down a little bit and figure that out. Some of them we got enough brood up that we could probably pull two splits off if I put them in nuke boxes and things like that. But just an average check going through a colony, you know, if all you want to do is make sure it's healthy, you can do that in just a a minute or two or less you know, yeah. less than a minute but but i usually don't i usually don't end up doing that but it's possible that's how you should do it how about you that, what do you think that, so it, it sounds like you and i are doing the exact same thing i mean you just what you just described is spot on to what we're doing i mean it's a one minute it's a one minute health check it's a four minute if we've got to reorganize the brood boxes um, if we're shaking bees down, it's four minutes, you know, below a queen excluder. Um, and then if you come across <clears> something <throat> where there's a problem, that's where you end up spending six, seven, eight, ten 10 minutes and, and it changes the, the course of your day. Do you do any beekeeping at night at all? Well, it's funny. You should ask <laughs> last night, uh, Brian helped me. We did, we set up a bunch of splits. I set up a bunch myself on Friday. He helped me yesterday. And then last night I had one more bee yard I needed to check. And um, it was, the sun was going down over the horizon when I got there. There were only six colonies there, so it wasn't many. So I went out there last night and got there. And one of them I had peeked in the night before I was driving past her and it was getting dark. It was almost dark when I got there. And that one just needed to have an, a, a box added to it, a second deep. And when I pulled that thing up, they started boiling over the edges. And so, yes, I just put the box <laughs> on the left. I'm like, I cannot go in these other five. five. And so last yeah. time I got there and the first two or three, it was kind of light. And the last couple, it was pretty dark. But the first two were super strong. And, and even though I'm managing these bees for a friend, he actually – his contract to me to do that each year he pays me to take care of his colonies for him out there mm-hmm. um I, I think it's just healthy to pull a split out if they need it because i just and i'm probably going to set those i may even set them in the same bee yard right there because um i part of my deal is he pays me x number of dollars per year and uh, i just keep bees in those hives and drop the honey off at his doorstep he pays me what i think is a pretty good price to do that go. and so yeah. so i figure if i just pull splits off and set them right there if they need the splits if any of them die out then i can just set it up on a stand and he'll have them and if yeah. not then i can you know i can take them or do whatever i need to with them but that's kind of my goal this year last year i split them split them all i think i had about two or three dead outs and i split them all right there and they did pretty good but so I was out there and it was after dark. By the time I got done, it was basically dark. And, and you know, you just can't. It's just not fun. They're, call, they're, they're crawling on you. They're buzzing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You hear them. And somehow they find a way. Oh, yeah. I don't know oh, how yeah. they do it. Everything <laughs> zipped up, but they find a way. I guess they crawl up under the bottom of the jacket, maybe get up through. I'm not sure how they get in the veil, but they're crawling around on my my ear. and. Oh, no. And, they're, that's not, the they're, worst. Not, they're not They're not flying. They're just like, you hear them buzzing. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but they will sting you very rapidly, that very quickly if they get scared in the dark like that. When in the daytime, oh, yeah. when they're flying, you hear them like they try and fly and they're trying to get out. They want to be out. But at night, they don't, they can't, they can't see us. So they're just crawling everywhere. And it's just a, I don't like working at night. I just don't like working in them. I do it occasionally, but I've had some, 
less than pleasant experiences working at them right at dusk or at night. And so I know some people do that. It's just not something I like to do if I can help it. I have recently in the last year fallen in love with beekeeping at night. And by that, Uh I mean, I don't break into the, I don't break into the colony frame by frame. There's two, two divisive topics, which is, you know, do you feed bees and do you treat for mites? And yes, we treat for mites and yes, we feed sucrose syrup. And so I, I'm working a day job. You know, I don't get home till five, six o'clock. It's getting towards dark. We've got to hit three bee yards in one night. Um, I've had a number of nights in the last month where I'm feeding bees till 12 a.m. midnight. And um, I mean, just, just two nights ago. And I love it. You don't, we need to wear a veil. It was 60 degrees at night. I'm in a t-shirt and pants. I got a red hand, a red headlamp on. Um, I, I run, we run two way pallets and the feeders are on the inside. Let me make sure kind of next to each other. Yeah. So all you have to do is just pull the lids back just enough to expose the feeders yeah. and you can get through it. You can get through it and feed. You can do a colony inspection from above and, and below to look for, uh, 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 I, I'm doing just random checks sure. to see if anybody has swarm cells right now, just tilting the, sure. the box up. And then if, if it's packed, you know, so, so tonight actually um, we got into a yard, there's 32 colonies there. Uh, in, in one hour, I went through 32 colonies. We gave 17 of them a second deep box on top because we run all deep equipment. Um, so we gave them a second box and we fed all 32 in one hour. We are, we arrived at six on the dot and left at seven Oh one packed up, ready to go. Um, yeah. went by we, I mean, it's my daughter and I, and she wanted to play on my phone in the car. So it was a solo trip tonight. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's quick and easy. I, I got a little electric pump last year, one of those, uh, agricultural, like four GPM pumps, hundred foot hose. I mix feed in a barrel in the back of my truck. I've got my old truck from high school, high school still had it for uh, 20 years this year and it's got about 350,000 miles on it. Still runs great. And so we, you know, I'm I'm using a trolling motor to mix sugar syrup while we're going through and inspecting and then um, feed them and roll on. I mean, it's, I love beekeeping at night is just, I I don't, well, that kind of stuff I can see. I fed at night and stuff too. I, I, I have never really used in in high feeders. I need to, I usually, what we do and this is controversial is we do a lot of open feeding and uh, I've never really done a lot of, I've never used an in high feeder, honestly. And I've done some jars on the top or buckets on the top of the colonies a little bit. And uh, I know obviously if I'm going to get into more uh, building bees, selling nukes, selling queens. I know I'm going to have to get some in-frame feeders and start doing some of that, but I've never really done that. That's never been something I've done. Um, I, I think the bees, my experience with the open feeding is that the bees, it's almost like they feel like they're bringing it in, like they're working, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like they're having to yeah, work for yeah. it. And so it just, there's an attitude in the colony that is, it's a happy attitude. And I think they're happy if you feed, feed them inside too. I've just never done much of that. So what's your preferred method? If I can ask Do you like the boxes with the uh, uh, pine straw in them or. Yeah, we just, we just take the black, um, the black totes you can buy at Lowe's or wherever Sam's, whatever those black yeah. ones, the yellow lids. And then we'd cut holes in the side inch and a half two inches whatever drill you have and then we just yeah. throw the pine straw in there and fill them up with the syrup and then just uh, put the lid on there and they just and you got to make sure the pine straw is against the edges so the bees don't drown when they get in there and there's a few that meet their maker but most of them yeah most of them do very very few loss i started actually doing pollen sub that way too just putting it in a okay you can do it that way or you can just put it in an old hive body just mm-hmm. set the hive body out there and just the pollen sub in there and they just man they just they get in it they roll in it they love it and i actually did a five gallon bucket i did holes in the side for an experiment that works too just put the lid on the five gallon bucket and they get in there but i it's just a time thing for me i've never i've just never done the feeders i need to do that um we've got a a young guy here locally who is he has a full-time job but he also has around a thousand colonies or more now wow he he does like you like he's out many times until 11 o'clock midnight at night moving bees feeding bees whatever um but he has you know he just he sells a lot of nukes um just tons of nukes he sells a bunch and he's only been keeping bees i think since 2018 but he is really really good at what he does and uh but he has in high feeders like you're saying on the 
of he we, yeah. we mostly run four way pallets down here. He'll put them on the center part of the box, and so he just tips the lids out, slides them out, feeds them, slides them out, feeds them, and goes down the line yeah. that way. And so uh, there are a lot of things I have not done, a lot of things I have done. I've done a lot of unconventional stuff, um, but I've got to you know my whole goal the last, especially since we've, since we've been doing the stream team thing, and I've kind of gotten a little more focused is I've just got to be more intentional and and that'll help me be more efficient and it'll help me with everything. Part of my problem is I enjoy the YouTube thing almost as much as the beekeeping thing. And so I'm always looking for the next angle, the next shot, the next thing to do yeah. instead of just going to work. And um, I intentionally you know there's that word again on Friday, I didn't shoot any footage of me working the bees because I was doing it by myself. I knew Brian was coming yesterday and we got a little bit of him and I'm going to kind of try and put one video together of the whole splitting process that we're doing. Um, but I intentionally didn't spend a lot of time shooting footage because I, I just had to get some work done. But, you know, it really took me and it shouldn't have taken me this long. It took me almost two days to get about 35 or 40 splits done. And so I'm just I'm just too slow. The thing that I dislike about beekeeping a little bit by myself is you know, just carrying the boxes back and forth and setting up the equipment. The actual split itself doesn't take very long. But it's moving the boxes from the truck to the hives, moving the, just moving everything around. And mm -hmm. when you have someone yeah. there to help, it's so much faster. Just someone to kind of work with the frames and go get the boxes and grab the smoker and just kind of, it works yeah. so much. It's like that you say you would go twice as fast, but it's actually more than twice as fast. Yeah. Yeah. because especially if you find someone and Brian did a good job of this yesterday, you find someone that they can kind of pick up on what you're doing. And just kind of start yeah. jumping in and doing things without having to just be walk, talk through every little thing. When you have someone like that that yeah. can just jump in and kind of say, hey, this is what we're doing. Let's go to work. Then it can really pick up the pace tremendously. Tori and I, we were just hand in hand. I mean, it's just like the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. Yeah, um, that's 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 a yeah. good thing. And, and I had yeah. some, uh, when we've harvested honey the last couple of years, uh, we've had a really good crew pulling the honey from the colonies. You know, we got last mm -hmm. year, we had a great crew that just, we just started, you know, basically told, Hey, this is what we're doing. We had some fume boards and people just went to work and it just went so fast. Same thing when I did split splits last spring on the pollination bees when they came back, the young kid here, he's like in his early twenties and we had the pallets out there and I said, okay, Justin, this is what we're doing. We were pulling the, brewed up above the queen excluder adding a second deep right. to pull the splits off literally within one pallet he had it down so he worked one side of the pallet worked the other and we just went through all those just yeah. like in a more yeah. like in two or three hours we did all those like 48 44 45 splits and then by the afternoon it had been several hours and we just went ahead and made the splits and moved into a new location the bees moved up really nicely and everything worked out good so having help is a huge benefit oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and i just man i just i hate the logistical part of going and pulling the boxes out of the barn and putting them on the truck and then putting, I just, I don't like that part. I love being the bees, but that's the stuff I just do not. Do you like. pre, do you pre stage any equipment? What do you mean by that? So like right now we're, we're planning on pulling splits here in probably two weeks. Um, so every yard has, I mean, a yard of 40, I've got like 70 nuke boxes sitting out there ready to go. Like no, right in the I center. I haven't really done yeah, that. I, I, should I, do I take that the, more. I take the winter to go ahead and stage all my equipment. Just, you know, just kind of tuck back nook and cranny farming. Uh, all the landowners are great. They don't mind. I, you know, I tell them up front, but that way in the mid, you know, we've got enough going on right now that moving equipment is that much more. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's such a pain. I hate it. But yeah, that's not yeah, a bad idea. And I've thought about yeah. just keeping some stuff at each spot, but I've got, you know, and I probably have the same problem as most people. I've got like, I've got all kinds of nukes. I've got all, I've got all kinds of equipment, all categories of equipment. Yeah. And if you look at my bee yards, because last year I kind of got in a situation, I was out of equipment basically. So I just started double stacking nukes and triple stacking nukes. So I've got some bee yards where it's still nukes from last year. And it's just kind of a, the pollination bees are the ones that end up being consistent because they end up with the same looking, all the colonies are the same size when they leave. But everything else is just a, you just don't know what you're going to have. You may have single deeps, you may have double deeps, you may have a deep and a medium. And so everything is just kind of a mismatch, mishmash. I've always been one to just kind of keep stuff, um, keep the space open that I feel like the bees need in that colony and kind of let the colony grow into what I think they're going to instead of trying to make everything look the same. But yeah. the ideal way to do it would be to have everything kind of looking the same. And that's, that's the ultimate goal. Um, but, yeah. but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm figuring it out. So um, it, it's, it sounds like you're, 
you and I are just spot on. I mean, you're looking for those 2% and 3%, and they do. They add up. I mean, it may be three years from now, and you look back and go, man, I'm doing 20% better than what I was. You know, pre-staging equipment during the winter last season was just so nice to not have to pack up a truck every day or, or late at night, you know, uh, when you're just dog tired. It, it's Having the equipment already out there and sitting there is nice, and then it's ready to make splits. You're doing the same process you do, come in and you know, I like to split in the same yard, which you mentioned that way all the foragers fly home. Mm-hmm. And um, and then we'll come through at night and pick up all the all the nukes and take them back to our queen mating area. Do you leave that equipment sitting out there just in the weather? Just stack it oh, up? Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you had to remember, so th- I wax dip all of our oh, equipment. Yeah. So we've got 350 nukes that are wax dip. 300 nukes this year that are plywood 220 of those are like a year or two old they're painted i mean they're they're fine and then we've got about 100 brand new plywood this year as well we'll sell those uh, i tell people this um i'm not selling junk equipment i try to sell new boxes every year but when you start looking at like pro nukes, they're plastic, the viability of them long term, sitting in the sunlight. Even if I if even if I've got a two year old plywood box, that thing's gonna last six, seven years just as it stands. There's plenty of life left in it for uh, for somebody. And and oftentimes right now, getting used equipment, it already has the bee smell in it. It's sometimes even more cost effective than going with gesture nukes or uh, pro nukes, that kind of thing. There, there's something to the stackability of all that, but at the same time, uh, the, the boxers are made quality from the beginning, so uh, we don't end up with it. We don't end up with any rot. I don't, you know, if it's rotted, throw it on the burn pile, um, <laughs> you know. But for me, uh, the wax dipping, all my personal equipment is wax dipped. Uh, I built it the last twenty years. We've got about 70 queen castles with the four two-way um, or four two-frame uh, hives in them. It gives you a lot of options. It's 282 frames. It's 335 frames. And then we've got the additional 300 nukes this year. It gives you a lot of options for making a whole lot of splits. Um, sure. My problem is that I don't always know what I want to be when I grow up. So I've always focused on honey in the past. And so I've got, you know, I stack up my boxes and I've got a lot of honey supers. And now that I'm looking more into producing Queens and bees, of course you need to have more split like equipment split into. And so I'm kind of at that. I'm, I'm getting more focused on what I want to do. It's just taken me a while to get there, but I think ultimately, you know, I want to make enough honey to provide for my customers. And that's quite a bit. I mean, I sell quite a bit of honey every year. And then if I get bigger than that, then I want to start selling more nukes and, and uh, maybe get into Queens a little bit. But this young guy I was telling you about down the road here, um, Tyler, he is just a splitting machine. And so I'm going to try to hang out with him a little bit this year and kind of just see how he does it. He's super efficient and fast yeah. and uh, he sells, I mean, hundreds of nukes every year. I don't know exactly how many, but it's it's a ter- tremendous amount of nukes. And so, and uh, he still works full time, but I think his goal within the next couple of years is to go ahead and, and do it full time. He's really just a very impressive beekeeper. And I've got another guy who's a young guy too, that is my other kind of mentor, more in the pollination type stuff. And he's very efficient at splitting as well. But he, his big his big game is the pollination. He really likes to build up and send hives out, mm-hmm. out west. And that's kind of who I go. My bees were on his truck going out there. Okay. And he's got about 400 colonies, I think. So he's he's also pretty – and he's a banker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> both of these guys are financial guys, and, and, and they're both really good examples for me to learn from. And my biggest thing is just efficiency and deciding which direction I really want to go and then and then hitting it. I've all, I like to do it all. That's my problem. I'm interested in all of it and I'm interested in showing everybody what I'm doing with all of it. And I think I understand a lot of the fundamentals, um, but just getting more efficient and focused is my, that's my next challenge, what I need to do. So yeah, I, I, I love learning. I, I'm yeah, me too. Kind of the same thing, <laughs> man. I love meeting somebody else who's just doing it completely different. If nothing yeah. else, just to learn that one, that, you know, if you pick up one little key thing from 10 other people, man, it can yeah. really improve, you know, what you do. Well, that's one problem. And I think that's one, 
one of the drawbacks of YouTube too, is that there's so many people doing it successfully. There's so many people doing so many different things that I think sometimes someone who's new can get overwhelmed by that. And so, and so, but the bottom line is I tell people this, the, the principles, beekeeping basics are the same. You've got a queen, you know, you, you got drones, you got these number of days that it takes. They, they do certain things. They have to build wax and the basics are the same. But the bees are pretty resilient and really what we have to do as beekeepers is learn how to manage them. You know, you got the people who say that just let the bees alone. Just don't, you don't need to manage them. Just, you know, don't do anything with them. I'm like, as soon as you put them in a box where you want them to be, you've gone into that managing mode. I mean, you, you are their steward now. You are responsible yep. for them. In nature, bees don't typically have 20 colonies within, you know, 30 or 40 feet of each other. You know, mm. they are 50 feet. They, they space themselves out so and and a lot of bees in nature actually do die i mean there are a lot that's just the, the harsh oh, truth. oh yeah oh yeah and so it's like it's, it's a responsibility in my opinion it's a responsibility that i've taken on to manage these things and to try and figure out the best way to keep them alive if you manage the bees properly they'll be good to you as well and so i think it's yeah. it's important to remember that and and but it's a skill that you have to develop it's like anything else that you learn you just don't start doing it you're not good at it the first day you got to develop your skills. Um, I even look oh, at yeah. Brian, you know, look at Brian Cooper with Castle Hives, one of our stream team guys there. And, you know, he's a hobby guy and he lost everything just a couple of years ago, lost everything, didn't have any bees left. Man. But now he's up to 11 colonies and he's become intentional as to what he's doing. He dropped back, he figured out what he was doing wrong and he developed a plan. And he's worked that plan with treatments and feeding and really learned the fundamentals and now he's got i think 10 or 11 booming colonies and he doesn't know what he's going to do with all the bees because he doesn't want any more bees so you've got to just develop those skills and then move forward we've kind of come up we're kind of at our hour time yeah yeah, yeah. that happens so i'm kind of bruce just, thanks thanks for having me man this has yeah. been, been great well as we as we wrap this up um just kind of go back and and maybe some words of wisdom you know i think the the main thing we wanted to talk about here was a little bit about the kind of how to grow sideline or the importance of developing your own queens, developing your own bees. And so do you have any final thoughts, any kind of summary you'd like to put on this thing? Um, uh, what kind of words of wisdom or advice or final thoughts would you have to those who may be watching this video? Be honest with yourself about what's your weakness. Um, for, for us, we, we said about this time last year, Corey and I, I said, look, if we're going to reach these milestones we have to learn to graft and we have to do it well and it, we had some screw ups bruce like we had we had one time we we grafted 48 bars and we got seven cells 48 bars of 16 i mean when i tell you we screwed up like but go fail go screw up for a whole season but figure it out um, you know, we were grafting about once a week for eight weeks and, um, we eventually figured out what was right and what was wrong and pollen patties and feeding and overpopulation. And, and then once you do it eight, 10 times in a row, you know, to eight, 10 colonies, you start to see a pattern, you figure out what's working. And, uh, if you're scared of grafting, go for it, um, go, go screw up for a, for a year. It'll pay dividends for 20 years in the future especially if you're thinking about in business terms, whether it's sideliner or whether it's your day job, uh, my advice would just be to go for it and, and knock on some doors and meet your neighbors and ask people at church. And it's, it, it wasn't really all that hard to set up the queen breeding yard. And I'm very excited about watching, you know, watching what comes out of it. At the end of the day, mother nature is still mother nature. I, I can't control the weather and a lot of other factors, but you know, they say if you build it, it will come. Um, we, we're doing everything that we know to do to make great quality queens. And I think over time, it'll it'll get better for us. And, and ultimately, for the viewer at home, it will for you too. And that's, uh, it's just fun talking to folks like you that are kind of uh, up and coming and, and you've got your sights set where they, where you want them to be and, and you're going to get it. And I think that's awesome. And uh, I'm still trying to figure out everything, but I'm getting a little closer to where I want to be. And so I've, you know, I've gone from that hobby standpoint. I became a sideliner pretty quick. I don't know if I'll ever get to the commercial side of things, but I guess kind of the theme tonight has been kind of how to grow from hobby to sideliner to commercial, and then the importance of developing your own stock in that process. Yeah. And so 
Uh, we hope you've enjoyed watching the video tonight, everybody. Um, once again, this is Ashby Miller with Ashby Farms, North Carolina on YouTube. Go check out his channel. And uh, he's got some real good content on there. I've been watching a little bit of it, just kind of bare bones, what he's doing in the hives, thought process for how he's doing it. And uh, from talking to you tonight, Ashby, the other day on the phone, it, it obviously you've put a lot of time and work and effort into the thought process and you've, you've got a plan penciled out what you want to do and you're going to get it. And so I really appreciate you coming on tonight and joining me for this uh, on Bruce's Bees here for this intentional beekeeping, I guess you call it a podcast or a playlist, whatever you want to call it, but I appreciate you coming on here. Uh, I think there's some really good uh, nuggets here, some good information that can help folks moving forward. Bruce, thanks for having me on. I, I look forward to us getting together and talking soon. Yeah, maybe I can get up there one of these days. That'd be fun to see what you're Come doing. Come on. Come on. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. All right. We'll go ahead and close day. it out. Thanks, Ashby. Yeah, you got it.